Mr. President, during your address, you figuratively speaking, you were talking about spending trillions and trillions, suggesting the plan for the development of the country, which uh, was absolutely amazing. This Russia looks different. It will have different infrastructure, different social system, uh, a dream country. So, and uh, I would like to ask you the question, where, where will we get this money? Have we earned them? Well, first of all, it all has been planned as a result of uh, hard work by experts, by the specialists from the government, from the administration. Everything is fitting into the budget rule and it's pretty conservative actually because certain experts believe that there should be more income and there will be more income. So we could have planned even more expenses because it should be directly reflected on the development of the economy, which is the right thing, right way to go in principle. But in 2018, we had already planned to allocate for the development of the economy of the social field 8 trillions, then we expanded these expenses, made them bigger. So if everything goes the way it is planned by the optimists from this expert, among these experts, then we will be able and we will make these expenses bigger, various directions. We are speaking about the next six years. Yes, we are speaking about the next six years and now we are drafting a budget for the next three years for the planned period of three years, as we call it. But of course, when we have been preparing for the address, I'm saying we have been preparing for the address because it uh, was an entire team. We came from the assumption that we are going to consider the key areas of possible income for our country. But there is absolutely amazing projects, for example, Sochajugba Highway, 130 kilometers, 90 kilometers of tunnels and the rest of it are bridges. Looking at the landscape, three, one and a half billion over the first three years only. And ideally, the highway should be ready by 2030. To which extent do we really need this and will we have enough for the victory then? Well, people require this, people need this because families with children, they will not be able to travel to Sochi by car. So they always get stopped near Kelenchik, near Novorossiysk because they have to stop there because it's a difficult road, so it's a mountainous road. And there are various projects, we have talked about this already, so either we extend it to Jugba or first from Jugba to Sochi. So some of the government members believe we should uh, make it gradually, step by step. Others say that we need to build the whole thing right away. Other ways we are going to have bottlenecks between Jugba and Sochi. So the first part, if we look from Novorossiysk, it's more or less okay, and the surface is okay, but it's too narrow. And if we are going to build the road, the first part to Sochi, then in that small area, in that small space, we might have traffic jams, and we have a lot of them already now. So we'll think it over with the specialists, how it will be done, in what stages, but it must be done. So we need to calculate the price of the project, the expenses on the project, so we need to stay within the financial plans that we have. First of all, we should think about the interests of the people, but also about the interests of the territory, about the interests of the country. 
if we can afford this large-scale investment means that the country is getting richer under the conditions of the special military operation, under the conditions of almost 15,000 of crazy sanctions. And uh, we have set out a goal to decrease poverty, including in uh, families with many children. Are we being too, aren't we being too daring? Well, if we go back to this road, when I spoke about this with the government, you know, the finance ministry, in good sense, of the word, they are pretty greedy, so they are being very conservative about the expenses. And the finance minister told me only those who have never traveled by this road might have anything against building this road. And he's right. Especially it is important for the families with the children as for whether we are getting richer or not. But the economy is growing, which is a fact, and this fact has been recognized not by us, but by the international financial economic organizations, by the imperative purchasing parity. We are now ahead of uh, Germany. We are now ranking five among the biggest economies of the world. Germany's economy decreased by 0.3 percent, if I'm not mistaken. And we have grown by 3.6 percent. Japan has grown a little bit. But if everything goes at the same rate as today, we have every chance to become number four economy in the world to replace Japan in the near future at that. And But we have to be frank. We have to be objective. There is difference between the quality of our economy. As for the purchasing power parity, yes, we are ranking five and we have every chance to become number four instead of Japan. But the structure of the this country's economy is uh, better than ours. And we still need to do a lot to catch up, not only in regards of uh, purchasing power parity, but with the per capita income. And we need to change the structure. We need to make it much more efficient, much more modern, much more innovative. That's what we have to do. As for the income, well, purchasing power parity is an important indicator. It's uh, the volume of the economy, the size of the economy. It means that the state from the taxes is getting enough funds to resolve its strategic goals. We can develop in the way we deem fit for our country. You've been speaking about the structure, about the need to uh, to change structurally if we are speaking about our economy. But that what was your address about. That's the goal, to develop innovative industries, to make them grow faster than the average rate of growth in the economy. Well, of course, I have already said that the structure, that's what we must work on. And a lot of things depend on that. The future of our economy depends on that the future of our labor resources, the efficiency, the labor efficiency and productivity. One of the main goals that we have now is to increase the labor efficiency because under the conditions of the shortage of the uh, labor resources of workers, we have only one way to efficiently develop, to improve the performance, to improve the efficiency. It means that we must increase innovative part of, of labor. Now we have 10 robots per 10,000 workers, and we need to have at least 1,000 robots per 10,000 workers. I think that's how it is in Japan now. And to have people who are able to work, in these industries, in these enterprises, we need to train highly qualified personnel. So we have allocated this entire field of engineering training. Probably you notice that we have 30 modern engineering schools across the country. We are going to launch 20 more engineering schools. We are going to have 50 engineering schools and 50 more in the coming years. So these areas 
It's the future of our country, and we are going to make progress in this regard. And the final question about the sanctions. Uh, many people express the idea to establish a special body to fend off sanctions, to handle sanctions in general. Do you plan anything of this kind, or there is no sense in doing that? There is no need. We are analyzing the situation, the Central Bank, the government, the relevant ministries, they are analyzing the situation. A lot of things are done not out of political or military considerations. They are doing things just out of uh, unfair competition. They are hiding behind them political considerations or military considerations, for example, in the aviation industry and many other industries as well. Well, that's the world we live in, that's the world we have. We have adapted, we understand uh, who we deal with, and we are being quite efficient, we judge by the result of our work. But sanctions is not the only thing that the West is using against, against us. I'm quoting your address now. The West is trying to drag us into new arms race to repeat the trick that they did in the 1980s with the USSR. So do we have enough uh, reserve if these arms race will happen? We need to have a maximal return in every ruble we invest in the military field. No one have calculated the expense. Uh, no one has uh, ensured the efficiency of this investment. In the USSR, the military expenses were some 13 percent of the GDP. And uh, if we look at the Stockholm Institute's uh, reports, Last year, the military expenses were 4 percent, and this year, 6.8 percent. So we have increased by 2.8 percent. Well, that's a significant growth, but that's not a critical growth. In the Soviet Union, it was 13 percent, and now we have 6.8 percent. And uh, I have to say that the military expenses, defense expenses, they are helping the economy to be more vigorous, so to say, but there are certain restrictions to that as well, and we understand that. This eternal question, so what's better, cannons or butter, we keep this in mind, but even the modern defense industry that we have now, what's good about it, it not only has an impact on the civilian industries as well, but it employs innovations necessary for the defense industry, and it is using these innovations to manufacture civilian goods as well, which is uh, very important. And um, expenses are not comparable. Look at the United States. Almost $900 billion, $860 billion or something. So you cannot compare it with the expenses that we have. So probably they embezzle a lot because they do not have hyper sound weapons or anything. I will explain. They spend a lot of money on maintaining not only to pay salaries, but they have to maintain their military bases across the world. And it's like a black hole. So you, it's impossible to calculate anything. That's where they embezzle most of it. But also when they manufacture weapons and uh, ammunition, they also spend such amount of money that it's really hard to assess, to estimate. If you calculate how much they spend on their missile defense system, the famous one that they have, and one of the main components of uh, overcoming this missile defense that we have is avant-garde intercontinental missile uh, gliding vehicle of intercontinental range. So you cannot compare this budget. Basically, we zeroed out everything that they have invested into their missile defense system. That's 
what we do. That's how we act. But the economy of our armed forces itself, it must uh, respond to the current realities, to the current requirements. Justice, it's a magical word for Russian language. You use it very carefully, but once you said this word in your address and it sounded as a lightning, as a thunder, you said that distribution of uh, tax burden must be more just in Russia and you suggested the government to think to think in what way to think about what well this is true this tax burden distribution must be just in the sense that uh, the budget to accomplish the national goals to accomplish the goals of fighting poverty. Corporations should spend more on that. Legal entities and individuals who make more money should be investing more into that. So are we speaking about progressive tax? Well, something like that. I would not want to go into detail now because we need to work on it, but we need to build a system in such a way that it was more efficient to resolve social issues that the state is facing in this regard. We plan to decrease uh, taxes for the families with many children and there are a number of other steps that we are going to make in this direction. I believe that the society will be fine with this. That's one. And secondly, that's what businesses want from us. So they want as to make the tax system clear and then leave it as it is to make it stable. That's the biggest requirement, the biggest demand from businesses. That's what government will be doing in the next few months with the State Duma deputies. Won't we scare away someone with this progressive taxation because we were afraid of that in the past? Well, we have the established system now, even those who were advocates of this flat rate, the authors of this flat rate taxation, they believe that now we can be more selective in the way we use taxes. In your address, you thank the colleagues from the government, so you use this wording. Does it mean that if you win the elections, the Mishustin's government will remain. Well, we need to speak about this after all the votes are calculated. That's a wrong thing to discuss now. But in overall, the government is working. We can see the objective results. It's working quite satisfactory. It's works quite satisfactory. You m mentioned the decrease of the tax burden for the families with many children children in general and the demographical situation in general, these topics were... So you spoke at length about these topics during your address, which is a painful issue in a way for us because demographically Russia is uh, becoming smaller and smaller. And last year uh, we have set an anti-record if we are speaking about birth rate, 1.31 or 1.33, 1.39 children per one woman of the childbearing age. I guess ideally we need to double this indicator or triple it because it's a disaster for the society. But nevertheless, you have suggested quite a massive program to support maternity, to give a demographic impetus to the society. Do you have confidence that these measures will help to change the situation, to change the trend from decreasing to increasing to upswing? Well, in overall, if we speak about all the support measures for the families with children, then over the six years we plan to spend 
up to 14 trillion rubles, which is a huge sum of money. And uh, areas, types of support, there are many of them. Uh, construction or renovation of kindergartens, construction of new schools, renovation of old schools, bringing them up to the requirements of the modern day, supporting women from pregnancy up until their children are 18. Almost one woman out of three are receiving allowances and uh, a lot of children are receiving allowances, more than 10 million children receiving allowances, which is a serious effort. We will continue the maternity capital program. We have extended uh, the payments. Now the decisions are being made over 150,000 uh, rubles per family if they have a third child to pay out the mortgage loan we have preserved the uh, subsidies for the benefits for the mortgage loans for the families with children so there are a lot of uh, ways to support the families with children and as you have mentioned and of course it also includes fighting poverty because families with children have a much harder time than families without children course, expenditure-wise, but still, we've managed to do a lot in this regard. If we look 20 years back, we had I think we had some 29% of the population below the poverty line, that's 42 million people. Now it's 9.3%, as the latest data suggest. But still, it's 13.5 million people, still a lot. Still, we have to do everything to get it down to at least 7%. And for families with many children, this... We need to work there as well. Speaking of... Well, birth rate issues, specialists say that these things are, well, objective factors. We had two great declines in birth rate. First one is 1944 and 43 during the Great Patriotic War, and then during the collapse of the Soviet Union. The slump was just as serious because the social welfare system However weak it might have been in the USSR, it collapsed. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, it disappeared as well. Then there was utter poverty. Well, at least the planning terms decreased and birth rate fell to wartime figures. Then we had an increase in Right now we have quite a lot of young people, children, who are going to reach fertility age in, in a couple of years. So what you have been mentioning is a world trend. There are only, uh, there are only few countries with developed economies that have been showing positive dynamics. All other countries are in the red in this regard. There's a whole host of issues related to that, economics, life priorities, women's life priorities. I guess we better steer clear of that. It's up to demography scientists to look for solutions. But what makes me optimistic is the general mood in the society. 70% of men and 72% of women want to have two and more children. And the state has to support them in this. And there is a whole spectrum of support measures that we're working on, and we will do that. But still, Mr. Putin, 
there is yet no confidence that these measures will help change the situation. In the late 1990s, and it's a well-known story, I think you told it, you saved your children from a burning house. You literally walked into a burning house. And only after saving the children, you remembered that there was some money in the house, and the money did burn. So this says something about your priorities. Children first, money second. Maybe it's the same when it comes to the country, like children first, money second. Maybe we should create a program that will help change the situation for sure. Well, in the early 2000s, in the early noughties, we took a number of steps, including introduction of the maternity cap capital that brought positive results. So it is possible to, to achieve the figures that we want. We have such experience, and we need to capitalize on this experience and on other modern development to achieve the, the targets that we set. And then we will adjust those measures or <coughs> add other things and instruments. For example, we have announced this year, the year of the family, there is a national project coming up. And there are things there that we have never used before. 70 billion rubles is earmarked for regions with birth rates lower than the average across the country, mostly central regions and the Northwest. 70 billion is big money. It only needs to be used smartly. And there is also well, caring for the elderly and other support measures. So we need to increase the birth rate and in increase the life expectancy across the country. This will allow us to stabilize the population. And this is the key integral indicator of our work. Work that requires attention on all administrative levels. Well, like anywhere in the world, there is also the third instrument of solving demogra demographic problems, and that's immigration. What figures are we looking at in the next six years? Well, speaking of work immigrants, we don't have as many of them as other countries. A total of 3.7% of all working population. They are concentrated in regions where the economic life is more active, and there are more of them, by an order of magnitude, more of them. And that's Moscow, the northwest, some northern regions where compensation levels are high. But without any doubt, this is an issue that requires special attention on all levels of administration, be it regional or federal. What I would like to say is very important. When work migrants are brought in, they always, the authorities always say that they need to do that due to shortage of working hands. But our business people, entrepreneurs, must realize that the situation for them, from the point of view of having work in hands, is not going to get better. They're going to face shortage of workforce. And to solve this problem radically, getting back to what I've been talking about, we need to increase labor productivity and reduce the number of people working in areas where more can be achieved by introducing state-of-the-art technologies. But that requires investments in this sphere, and that requires training talent. This is the most important thing that we need to keep in mind. And of course, immigration policy is, in, is an important instrument. 
And it doesn't hurt here to look at experience of other countries. First of all, we need to look at repatriating our well, fellow Russians, compatriots. The definition of compatriot is set forth in our legislation. No need to repeat myself in this. Maybe we should reach out to people who are not willing yet to relocate to the Russian Federation, but whose talent and skills can allow them to make an important contribution to the development of our country. And as for the traditional work migrants, we need to think about how to prepare them for relocation to Russia together with governments of the countries where they live now. And that's studying Russian language, our cultures and traditions. We need to well, we need, we need to guarantee that they are received well here, that they are, that they receive jobs here, and all this taken together, I hope, will give a positive effect. And of course, all of them need to observe our traditions, the legislation of the Russian Federation, and of course, well, sanitary norms and the like. security of the Russian or the citizens of the Russian Federation must be the top priority the Russians are probably the biggest distributed ethnicity in the world one of the people you've spoken to said that in Zaporozhye region we found out that they are well, people just like us it looked like quite a revelation for him, and probably it was. Now we are, well, including new regions. You said Odessa is a Russian city, and there is hope in this regard as well, right? Well, of course, the density of population in those regions have always been has always been pretty high. The climate there is great. And as for Donbass, it's an industrial region since the Soviet times. Well, the, the USSR invested a lot in that region, in its coal mining industry, in its metal foundries. Of course, it's going to take investments to ensure that production facilities there are well, state-of-the-art and labor conditions for people are not what they used to be a couple decades ago. And as for the new Russian reg regions, it's a region with very well-developed agricultural sector. And we're going to do everything there to support traditional economic activities there and new ones that fit harmoniously in the economy of those regions and the willingness of people to develop them. The people there are very talented and, as I said, the state budget has even been receiving taxes from there already. Of course, we need to pull them up to the general Russian level, but they are going to get to gain momentum, and that will happen soon. Well, historically, it's obvious that Nazi regimes don't dissolve by themselves. They are usually they usually disappear following a military defeat. I'm speaking of Germany, Italy, Japan. The same is obviously going to happen to the Nazi regime in Ukraine. And we're now advancing all along the front lines, judging by reports from the Ministry of Defense and our military correspondents. Has in the offensive, when our troops are on the offensive, has the army found a way to ensure that our losses are lower than those of the 
NMA. Because the, the, the issue of casualties is always an obstacle in the way of any offensive. It's, and the desire to save lives is, of course, easy to explain. Well, the answer, the question is simple, but the answer is simple as well. We need to increase the number of munitions, the number and power of weapons and armaments and assets deployed in the area. Aviation, tactical and army aviation and strategic long-range aviation, I mean with munitions that are acceptable for armed conflicts of this scale. That would be land-based assets, including high-precision assets and artillery, armored vehicles. Our development is going in light years in this regard. No exaggeration here. That's the answer to your question, I think. The more powerful our assets are, the, the lower our casualties. The question is bound to arise. What price are we ready to pay for the entire, I wouldn't call it a project, but for this entire this entire challenge that we were forced to face. Every human life is invaluable, is priceless. And the loss of any person or any family is a huge grief. But the question is, it's about the very definition of what we do. You may have noted that one of the people we were talking to, we found with, with a degree of surprise that there are people just like us there, and we came to help those people. That's essentially the answer to your question. If we abandon those people there, then tomorrow our losses will grow by orders of magnitude and our children will not have a future because we will feel insecure. We will be a third or fourth grade country that nobody is going to reckon with if we can't defend ourselves. And the consequences may be catastrophic for the Russian statehood. That's the answer. The Americans seem to be talking about strategic stability, yet at the same time they're talking about the need to deliver strategic defeat to Russia. Our position is that we are open for negotiations, but at the same time, the time for good gestures is past. We are out of good gestures. So is there going to be no negotiations? We've never given up the idea of negotiations. But, well, no gestures, then no compromises, then. Well, let me try to explain here. When we were doing the negotiations in Turkey, as I've said many times, I can repeat that once again. Moreover, with the negotiators from the other party, we ended up with a fat stack of documents, a draft of a, of a treaty, and an excerpt from that treaty, it's available. It was signed by the leader of the negotiations group on the side of Ukraine, Mr. Arahamia. There is a signed paper in my office but as Mr. Arahamia himself said in public at a meeting with international journalists, ex-Prime Minister of the UK, Mr. Johnson, came and talked them out of finally signing and ultimately observing this treaty. Uh, 
And then they started talking about the need to deliver a battlefield defeat to Russia. Are we ready for negotiations? Yes, we are. We are willing to negotiate. The negotiations should be based not on some wishful thinking after using some substances, but negotiations based on the reality that we have on the ground, as they say. That's one thing. But two is many times we've been promised lots of things. Non-proliferation of NATO to the east. Next thing we know, they are standing at our borders. We were promised, not going deep into history even, we were promised that the domestic conflict in Ukraine will be solved using peaceful political means. And three ministers of foreign affairs came to Kiev, Poland, Germany and France, and they promised to be guarantors of those agreements. One day later, a state coup took place. We were promised that Minsk agreements will be observed. And then they publicly said they were not going to observe those. They were only winning time to arm the Nazi regime in Ukraine. Many things were promised to us, so promises are not enough anymore to start negotiations just because they are running out of ammo oh, would be ridiculous on our side. We are nevertheless ready for a serious conversation and we are willing to resolve all the conflicts, especially this particular conflict, by peaceful means. But we must understand clearly for ourselves that this should not be a pause that the enemy will use to rearm itself. It should be a serious conversation with security guarantees for the Russian Federation. And we know of the options, we know of the carrots they want to show us, to convince us that the moment has come. Once again, we are willing to resolve all the conflicts, all the arguments in this particular conflict by peaceful means. That's what we want. We are ready for this. But this should be a serious conversation with uh, ensuring security for the warring sides. Well, and first of all, we are interested in the security of the Russian Federation. That's where we stand. I guess we are being too noble. Wouldn't be that once again we will sign something, we will sign some agreement with them, and they will deceive us, and we will console ourselves that we were honest, and then it will be our destiny to get fooled all the time. Americans in the 1990s, they coined medals for the victory in the Cold War. And since then, all these decades, they were decades of great lies. How can we expect them to go and sign a non treaty, non-est agreement with us that they will carry out that they will implement with any guarantees for us. So how do we do this? Do you really believe that this is possible? I don't want to say that, but I don't trust anyone. We need guarantees. And these guarantees must be in writing and they must be the guarantees that will make us happy, that we will trust. That's what we are saying. I think maybe it's uh, 
a little bit premature to see what these guarantees could look like, but we are not going to believe some empty promises anymore. I guess you will be cited. So you do not trust anyone or you do not trust Western partners when you're saying that you do not trust anyone. I prefer to deal with uh, facts, not with some good intentions or conversations about, well, the thing that one should trust everyone. When you make decisions at such a level, the responsibility for the consequences of the decision is huge. So we are not going to do anything that is not in the interest of our country. What happened with Macron? Has he gone mad or something? He is going to send French troops to fight against our army. He looks a little bit like this uh, feisty gull rooster. He is scaring the Europeans even. How should one react to this? The thing is that the Western troops, Western military are there. They have been there before the coup d'etat and after the coup d'etat, their numbers have grown many times. They are present there now as uh, advisors. They are there as uh, mercenaries and they are suffering losses. But if we speak about official military contingents of foreign countries, I'm confident it will not change the situation on the battlefield. That's the most important thing. Same as weapon supplies do not change anything. Secondly, it could lead to very serious geopolitical consequences because if, for example, Polish troops will enter Ukraine for the excuse they use to secure the Ukrainian-Belarusian border or in some other locations, to allow Ukraine to use Ukrainian troops to send them to the contact line for hostilities. I think the Polish troops will never leave anymore. Well, at least that's what I think. Because they will want to bring back, they dream about that, they want to bring the lands back that they believe to be historically Polish and they believe they were taken from them by the father of nations, by Joseph Stalin, and they were handed over to Ukraine. Of course, they want them back, and if the official Polish troops will enter these lands, I don't think they will leave. And then other countries could follow suit, who lost some of their territories after World War II. And I think the geopolitical consequences for Ukraine, even from the point of view of their statehood, of preserving their statehood, I believe. So these consequences, all these issues will manifest themselves. If we go back to Macron, maybe he decided to avenge Russia for stepping on their toes in Africa. So probably he did not expect us to be so active there. Well, I guess there is certain bitterness when we stayed, stayed in contact directly, we spoke about this frankly. We did not go to Africa. We did not squeeze anyone out of Africa. But The Wagner Group, it started with some economic project in Syria, then it moved on to other countries, to some countries in Africa. 
we are supporting this group, but only from that point of view that it's a Russian group. We have not squeezed anyone out. It's just that African leaders from certain countries made agreements with the Russian economic operators. They wanted to work with them. In certain areas, they did not want to work with the French. It was not our initiative. It was uh, an initiative from our African friends. I do not understand why should they feel bitter about anything. If an independent country wants to develop relations with some other country, including Russia, for example, Russia, we have not done anything to these former French colonizers in these countries. And I'm not being ironic because historically, in many of these countries, France was a metropole, was a mother country, and they do not want to deal with them anymore now. So we have nothing to do with this. So maybe it's just a convenient stance for them to take offense and not to notice the problems, the issues that they have. Maybe this embittered emotional reaction from the French president, well, has to do with what's happening in certain African countries, among other things. But I know there are African countries that are willing to work with the French, to deal with the French. Other countries, they do not want to do that, and we have nothing to do with that. We are not trying to talk someone out of dealing with anyone else. We do not have any state goals there. We are just being friends with them. They want to develop relations with us. We reciprocate. So I don't think there is anything to take offense of. Now in France, they say there are no red lines and nothing is possible and everything is, nothing is impossible, everything is possible. And they want to talk to us uh, based on the balance of forces. And we hear a lot of things like that from France, from Lithuania. So this uh, pretty hostile chorus chorus of voices. So maybe we should also make some non-standard decisions, and maybe we could do, ask for assistance to two million strong North Korea to offer them in exchange our nuclear umbrella over North Korea. Well, first of all, North Korea, they have a nuclear umbrella of their own. They have not asked us for anything. Secondly, from what we see now, from what's happening on the battlefield, we are doing quite fine with the goals that we have set out for ourselves. As for those states who are saying that they have no red lines in regards of Russia, well, they need to understand that, that Russia will have no red lines in regards of these countries. As for small nations of Europe, well, first of all, we treat everyone with respect, no matter what. And secondly, when they, these small nations, call for toughening policies against Russia, they are calling for some extreme measures, for example, for sending troops, these nations, these states, and they understand this, they understand that they will feel no consequences of these provocational statements that they, uh, that they make. And those who will face the consequences, they behave in a restrained manner, and rightly so. But all these stories about Germany with its towers, missiles, Schultz is saying that we are not supplying these missiles. There is some people who insist on sending towers, missiles to Ukraine. The British, they offer their initiatives, so we are ready to supply them on our own. If you supply it to us, the goal is the Crimean bridge. German generals are planning operations, not only against the Crimean bridge, but also against the military bases in the depth of the Russian territories. 
Some people say that these missiles could be used to strike the Kremlin. Aren't they going too far in all this wishful thinking? Well, these are fantasies. They're trying to cheer themselves up, trying to intimidate us. As for Germany, they have problems of uh, constitutional nature. Well, they say the right thing. What will happen if this Taurus missile will strike that part of the Crimean bridge that even in their own understanding is part of the Russian territory? But the opposition in Germany is being even more aggressive. But we will see what decision they'll make because we are monitoring the situation. But they are using the English, the American missiles. It does not change the situation. Of course, it inflicts as damage. But in the gist of thing, it does not change the nature of the hostilities. It does not change the consequences that are coming from the for, for the opposite side. Because we can now hear what's happening in Germany. We look your channels broadcasting and the Western channels are broadcasting. So some of them are broken. Some of them need to be updated or modernized. So let them work. Well, as you said, there are some things that these people should consider. The smarter of them will consider these things. And you NATO members, Finland, Sweden, what did they get in return? Foreign Minister of Sweden all of a sudden said to Turkey that Sweden is against of uh, deploying NATO bases in Sweden. Don't they understand what organization they entered? What happened to them? Well, you should ask them that. We used to have pretty stable, good relations with these countries, and I think that they gained more f from being neutral because it gives a certain advantage. For example, they could serve as a platform for negotiations to decrease tensions in Europe. We had perfect ideal relations with Finland. We had no complaints, we had no pretensions, especially territory problems. And we did not have any troops on the Russian-Finnish border. We removed all the troops from there. What did they have to do that? I guess they had only political considerations in mind. Probably they wanted to be a part of this Western club to be under some kind of an umbrella. Why did they need that? Honestly, I do not understand this. This step makes no sense from the from their national interest point of view. But nevertheless, it is up to them. So they made this decision. We did not have troops there. Now we will deploy troops there. We did not have strike weapons there. Now we will have strike weapons in there. Why? We used to have very good economic relations. They were using our market we acquired a lot of things from them, and now the situation will change. A lot of their commodities are not competitive in the other markets. We are not receiving the commodities we used to need from them. I do not understand this. Well, maybe it's a trivial thing, but nevertheless. And Helsinki and in the border towns of Finland, they were accepting rubles to to pay for the for, for any good, especially also in Helsinki in larger supermarkets. They had all kinds of uh, announcements in Russian. And now a lot of uh, organizations go bankrupt there. That's right. And from the economy point of view, it's good. The, Real estate prices were at quite a good level. From the economy point of view, it worked well. But probably there were some forces, maybe some nationalist, ultra-right forces. They did not like this uh, rapprochement with uh, Russia. They thought it was too much, too excessive. Russians are buying houses, buying real estate, everything is in Russian language here. So maybe at this 
level. So I do not think that. I know that uh, these uh, Russophobic sentiments start to develop, start to grow. Maybe some political forces inside the country decided to use these new inclinations in everyday life, new sentiments in everyday life. So maybe all these factors taken together brought them to make this decision. That's what I think, but I cannot say for sure. But it, it, it is not improving the situation from security point of view in no way. And in bilateral relations, in the relations with Europe in general, but nevertheless, in the United States, uh, there is an uh, active uh, presidential campaign going on, and they use you all the time, so you are a part of these campaigns because both candidates, a Republican candidate, Democratic candidate, are mentioning you in their speeches. It seems like you're always on their headlines, you're always in their news programs, and uh, you're becoming an argument in the presidential campaigns of both candidates. And you are fanning the flames when you're saying that one of the candidates is uh, well, better for us, more preferential. If a foreign pres president is saying that one of the candidates in the other country is uh, better for us, so it's uh, interference with the elections. Are you interfering with American elections by saying that Biden is a uh, more preferred option for us? So are you trying to troll them or what? Let me tell you one thing that's, I think, going to show that my preference haven't changed here. That's number one. Number two, we haven't been intervening in any elections. And as I said, we are going to work with any leader that the American people choose. But what's curious, in the last year of his term as president, Mr. Trump, the current presidential candidate, told me that I sympathized with Biden. That was four plus years ago. That's what he told me. You won't, I'm quoting directly here, you want Sleeping Joe to win. That's what he told me when he was president. And then much to my surprise, he was well, persecuted for, well, allegedly using some Russian influence to rig his elections. That's well, weird. As for the current election situation in the U.S., I think it's getting less and less civilized right now, and I would like to refrain from any comments in this regard. And I'm absolutely sure, and I think it's obvious to everyone, America's political system now cannot claim to be democratic in all senses of this word. Actually, your preference for Biden looks pretty weird to me personally, because back in 2011, Biden came to Moscow to talk you out of running for president. He told about this in his interview, in his talk with Russian opposition in Spasov House and the American embassy, and Garry Kasparov told about this that Biden came to Prime Minister Putin in 2011 to talk him out of running for president, threatening to stage another Arab Spring here in Moscow. Well, Biden wasn't obviously a big fan of yours, of you as a president, even back then. That's the historical truth, I think. See, I didn't pay much attention to that, obviously. I, I don't remember. Well, to him it was quite serious. It wasn't to you, right? Well, that's the sign of well intervening, tampering with elections. Well, as we said many times, and I said many times, we will not allow anyone to do that, to tamper with our elections. Now, going away from the subject of well, election 
battles. The escalation actually continues, and apparently both superpowers, Russia and the U.S., are playing what they call in, in America the chicken game. It's when chicken attack each other, and when guys in cars drive on a collision course, waiting for the other one to swerve first. And since nobody is going to swerve, does it mean collision is inevitable? Well, the U.S. just announced it's not going to enter troops. Well, we know what American boots on the ground means in Russian territory. That would mean intervention, and this is how, in, how we're going to treat this. Even if they appear on the territory of Ukraine, that's what I said. And I think Biden is a representative of the traditional political school. Well, apart from Biden, there are lots of other specialists in the area of Russia um, Russian-American relationships and strategic retention. Well, I don't think we're on a collision course. But, well, we, we are prepared for this. As I said many times, it's a matter of life and death to us, to them. It's a matter of improving their tactical position in the general world order and in Europe in particular. To them, it's about retaining their status among their allies. Well, it's important, of course, but not as important as it is to us. You said we are ready for that. Philosopher Alexander Dugin, a specialist in geopolitics, he directly calls for a nuclear war and basically prepares for it. And he said that the better we are prepared for it, the lower are the chances of the actual war. That's what he states. How can one be prepared to a nuclear war? Are we really prepared for one? Well, from the military and technical standpoint, yes, we are. Our nuclear assets are on permanent combat duty. Number two, and that's widely recognized, our nuclear triad is more up-to-date and state-of-the-art than any other countries, because there are two of them, actually, ours and the American. And we are more advanced in this respect. Our nuclear assets are more modern, and that relates, that applies to carriers and to actual munitions. Experts know that. That doesn't mean we have to compete in the number of nuclear warheads, but the experts, specialists, and the military, they know that very well. American, the Ameri America is currently struggling to improve the situation, to turn the table. But they are making certain plans. We know about that. Well, so do we. We're also working in this regard. But that doesn't mean that they're ready to unleash a war but tomorrow. But if they are, well, OK. But Maybe, for the sake of demonstration, Russia should stage nuclear tests. After all, there are no international restraints against that for us. There is a treaty that bans such tests, but unfortunately, the United States has not ratified this treaty, and here, to ensure we, to ensure parity in this regard, we withdrew our ratification as well. And since the treaty was not ratified by the U.S., it never came into effect. But still, we adhere to those agreements, but we know that the United States is pondering the possibility of such conducting such tests. Because when new types of warheads appear, 
Computer tests are not enough. They need to be tested well, naturally. Certain ideas, such ideas are entertained in certain circles in the United States. We keep an eye on that. We don't know if we need that, but if they conduct such tests, we may do the same. But we are always prepared technically for that. And I want it to be very clear. These are not conventional weapons. This is the branch of armed forces that in constant combat readiness. Well, in the tough moments of the last year in the battle lines after Kharkov or her son, did it ever occur to you to use tactical nuclear assets? Why? What for? By proposition of the then command of our group of troops, the decision was made to pull out of her son, but that didn't mean the front line was crumbling. Nothing like that. The decision was made to avoid casualties among personnel. That was the main reason. Because in warfare, when supplying our task group on the right bank of Dnieper was not possible, the decision was made to relocate to the left bank. And the correctness of such choice was later affirmed by the actions of the Ukrainian army later. They staged a real meat grinder there, just throwing barefooted people there, I mean literally barefooted. They tried to to drop ammunition there using boats and UAVs. What's that? That's slaughter. They were sending them to slaughter. I once asked my chief of general staff, there's nothing classified about this, I asked him, what do you think? Who makes those decisions on the other side? There is someone who makes those decisions, they, they have to realize that they are sending people to die here. He said, yes, they do realize. So who's making the decisions? Why would they do that? It's pointless. Yes, it is pointless from the military standpoint. What's the point then from any standpoint? Well, probably the, the top leadership has their own political considerations. Maybe they think they have a certain chance to break through our defenses or a chance to get some additional financing due to the fact that they have a foothold on the left bank, that there is a chance to like, serve their <coughs> position in the international arena. So they, they give an order And the prisoners of war taken there, they testified that they didn't even know what situation they were going into. There were units dropped there, and they were they had been told that the, the situation there is stable, go there and help out our guys, and they, they had no idea where they were going in, what they were going into. So, What's the point of using mass destruction weapons there? There was never any need for that, so it never occurred to you, no. Why? What for? Well, weapons are there to be used, and we have our own principles, rules of engagement, and we are ready to use any kind of weapons, including the ones you mentioned. If the existence of the Russian state is at stake, if our sovereignty and independence is at stake, is at stake, it's all written down in our strategy. We haven't changed it. 
So, Mr. Putin, when the in the end of his term, President Yeltsin suggested that you run for president. Your first response was, I'm not ready. Yes, that's my exact words. You've come a very long way since that time. If you had to write a, write a letter to yourself back then, what would you write? Well, it's like Yankee in King Arthur's court. It's, it's impossible to answer. That question was asked in that time, in that historical and economic context that the country was in. In that political situation, the domestic security situation, that whole context drove me to give the answer that I gave back then. I'm not ready. It wasn't that I was scared, because, but the sheer scale of the task was, was enormous, and the number of and the, the problems were snowballing. And I said it sincerely, not because I was scared, but I really thought I wasn't ready to solve those problems, and God forbid I would make things worse. Well, I said it sincerely, and if I got back there, I would repeat the same words, I think. But still, you did take up, you did take the offer. What was the reason? Well, our conversations with Boris Yeltsin, and what he said, he said, yeah, okay, I understand, we'll get back to it, and we got back to it several times. And in the end, he said, well, I'm an experienced person, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm offering. He said some other things to me. I wouldn't like to be bragging here, but he said some positive things about me, and he later confirmed it. Well, I won't go bragging right now, but and when we started working, well, when things got underway, you just go thinking, you have to do right now, you have to do this right now, this right now, and this and this. And once you get pulled into it, it's a whole different story. No time to be scared. Well, it's not about being scared even, it's about understanding your capability of dealing with those tasks. You remember what it was, 1999, what it was in the economy, in, in security, in finance, everything, everywhere. You once told that entering the Leningrad State University, or preparing to enter the State University, was a pivotal moment for you. You had to go all in, realizing that either you do this and you pass the tests, you enter the university, and then I'm going to do the things we're going to do. And you knew back then that you were going to work in KGB, or you lose, and then and then things will be entirely different, and there will be no chances. Do you think Russia is in the same all-in situation right now? Well, first of all, I wasn't in a, in a desperate situation back then. Well, of course, I wanted to work in state security. But entering the university, passing the entrance exams, no, it wasn't quite an all-in situation. I just came to the university and said, what do I do to enter? Well, the alternative was simple. Either I had to go to receive a higher education, preferably in law, or to go to the army. 
and have at least three years of work experience. Well, if I didn't, if I hadn't made it to the university, I would have gone to the army. That would have been a longer way to my goals, but still, there would have been a way. There was also, there's always a choice. Well, my high school was all about chemistry and mathematics, and then I went for well, humanitarian major. So, yes, there was a lot to do. I had to learn German language, I had to study German, I had to do history. So is Russia also on the crossroads here? Russia is not on the crossroads. Russia is on the, its strategic development path, and it's not veering away from it. To what extent do you feel the support from the Russian society in its new quality? Because there is now this new quality to the Russian society. Well, it uh, has always been there. Now it's manifesting. And it's a very good thing that we are now letting this deep Russian society to manifest itself. I think, I believe the people were expecting this. So for a common person, ordinary person to be in demand with the state, to be dependent upon by the state. Now this understanding that the destiny of the country depends on you, especially in security, it brought the strength of the Russian peoples to the surface. Do you feed from this? Always. It's not even about no, feeding from this. The main thing uh, that I see this request from the society, and I must be relevant to these requests, must be in line with these requests. But you're playing a key role not only in Russia, but globally as well, because billions of people see in you the hope for the global justice, for protecting human dignity, for protecting traditional values. So how does it feel to be under this kind of responsibility? Honestly, I do not really feel this. I just do my work in the interest of Russia, in the interest of our people. Yes, I understand what you're saying, and I can comment on this, but, you know, feeling, uh, being a master of uh, global destinies, well, I don't feel that. I'm just doing my work, just fulfilling my duty in the face of Russia, and to my duty to the people of Russia, to the people who believe Russia to be their homeland, as for the rest of the world, it has to do with the way we are treated, we are seen across the world. That's an interesting phenomenon, that's true. And uh, here's what I would like to focus on. You're right in the sense that many people in the world, uh, they are looking at what's happening in our country, what's happening in our struggle for our interests, and here is an important thing. Why is it happening? Not because we are formally a BRICS member or we have some traditional relations with Africa, which is also important as well. But the gist of it is different. The gist of it is that the so-called golden billion for centuries, for 500 years, they have practically lived off of other peoples they were ripping apart these poor peoples, poor nations of Africa. They exploited Latin America. They exploited the countries of Asia. And of course, no one forgets this. And I have a feeling that it's not even about the leaders of these countries, even though it is a very important thing, but the common people of these countries, 
In their heart, they can feel what's happening. They can see our struggle for our independence, for our true sovereignty. And they see this connection with their aspirations to be truly independent, which is exacerbated by the fact that in the Western elites, there is a strong desire to freeze the current unfair state of things. in international affairs. For centuries, they've been stuffing their stomachs with human flesh and they've been stuffing their pockets with money, but they must realize that this ball of vampires is about to end. Are you referring to their colonial aspirations? colonial habits, that's what it is, that's true. So you are painting an absolutely fair picture when people see certain hope in Russia and how has it happened that the Western propaganda with all its might, with its colossal, humongous resources and interest, it has not managed to isolate Russia to create this false image, even though they really aspire to to create this false image in the eyes of the other people. How has it happened? Well, I said that we, it is important for the people what they feel with their hearts. They do not even need some pragmatic explanations, despite all these waves of dirt. Well, in their countries, they are trying to brainwash them, and sometimes they are being efficient in this regard. And uh, sometimes they believe it's in their interest. They do not want to have the biggest country in the world as their neighbor, to have the biggest country population-wise as their neighbor. Well, it's, our population is not that big if you compare it with China or India, but still it is the biggest one in Europe. And now it's also the fifth biggest economy in the world. Why do, do they need a competition like this? Well, some American experts suggested that to divide it into three, four, five parts. They think it would be better uh, for everyone. That's the assumption they come from. They are being blinded, at least some of these Western elites being blinded by their anti-Russian sentiments. They were so happy when they brought us to this line beyond which we started to stop the war unleashed by the West in Ukraine starting from 2014 by armed means when we have started the special military operation. I think they were happy with this because they thought that now is the time when they can deal with us, when they can bring us to an end under this sanctions pressure, pressure by unleashing a sanctions war against us, by using Western arms against us with the hands of Ukrainian nationalists, they will end Russia. That's where these words about dealing a strategic defeat to Russia is coming from. But later they realized that it's uh, unlikely and then after that, they understood that it would be impossible. And instead of strategic defeat, instead of delivering strategic defeat, they are, well, basically helpless because they thought that the United States, almighty the United States, will help them. And now they are facing this helplessness in the face of, in the, face of the unity of the Russian people in the face of fundamental pillars of the Russian economic system and its sustainability and in the face of the growing capabilities of the Russian armed forces. And that's when they started to think those smarter of them. They started to think that the strategy towards the Russian Federation must be changed. Then they started floating these ideas about renewing, resuming the negotiations 
finding ways to end this conflict, to see what the real interests of Russia are. These are dangerous people, actually, because the people who think about some basic principles, it's easier to compete with them. You, you know, in old times in Russia, they used to say, you know, what's happiness for such people when you're dined, when you're wined, and when you have your nose covered in tobacco. So it's always easier to deal with such people when you have enough food, when you have enough drink. Well, and nose in tobacco is because it was smelling tobacco. Now it's nose covered in cocaine. So it's always easier to deal with these people, and it's always harder to deal with smarter people because they can influence the society, including our society, and they are going to float all these wings, presenting it as a carrot for us. I've said that when I answered your question about the possibility of the negotiations, but nevertheless, that's why there are now divisions, there are now contradictions inside the Western community. We do not, we do not want to split anyone, we do not want to divide anyone, but we will ensure our interests. I have to ask, Mr. President, these attacks on the Belgrade region, on the Kursk region, the military hostilities taking place currently in our regions. So they're being more brazen, more emboldened now. What has caused it? Well, the explanation is simple. It's happening against the backdrop of uh, there are setbacks on the line of contact, on the front lines. Not a single goal they have set out for themselves last year. They have not accomplished any of these goals. And more than that, the initiative is in the hands of our armed forces. Everyone knows this. Everyone admits this. I do not think it's anything, any revelation for anyone. And against the backdrop of these setbacks, they need to show something, they need to prove something. And mainly, they try to focus on information campaigns. So they try to attack the state border. First of all, they were using small reconnaissance sabotage groups. The latest report from the general staff said that some 300 people, including foreign mercenaries, the losses they suffered more than 200 people, some 230 people. Out of eight tanks they used, they lost seven. Out of nine armored vehicles, they lost nine, and some of them were American Bradleys. They were using other armored equipment, but mainly they were delivering troops using these vehicles, and then they were leaving right away. That what happened near the, near the state border in the Belgrade region. And nevertheless, the main goal, I have no doubt in this regard, was, well, if not to prevent the presidential elections from happening in Russia, at least to interfere with holding the presidential election with the expression of the people's will. Secondly, the information campaign, something that I've mentioned. And thirdly, if they succeeded somehow, they would have a chance, they would have a trump card in the potential future negotiations. For example, we are giving you back this and you're giving us back that. Well, as I said, those people who are happy when they're wined and dined and had, have their noses covered in certain substances, it's much easier to deal with them because they will continue with these actions at certain other parts of the state border and we are prepared for this. You mentioned this episode when you Save children from the fire, and now we have grandchildren. 
what country do you want to leave your grandchildren with? At the first stage, we must accomplish everything we've announced during the address to the Federal Assembly a few days ago. We have great plans. They are absolutely concrete plans in the economy, in the social area, in uh, support measures for maternity, for the families with children, uh, support for the retirees. We do not speak a lot about this lately, but we have allocated necessary resources for this as well. It concerns indexing the retirement allowances and the long-term care for the people who require this care. And uh, people of the older generations are those to whom we owe it that today we have a strong statehood, stable statehood and strong economy because despite all the hardships and challenges that the economy went through in the 1990s, it survived because of their hard work after the great patriotic war and so on. So we must not forget about that. We must not forget about the exploits of the older generation. We must remember it and we must recognize their work and uh, be grateful for this. But the future is uh, with the children, as I said, so that's why we have this program support measures for maternity, for the children. But the economy is foundation for all of this, so I hope it will be more high-tech, be more modern, will be based on the accomplishments of science, of technology, artificial intelligence, genetics, and so on and so forth. Look at uh, our agriculture where the modern technologies are employed. They are being employed, and we will continue to employ them. And the country will be self-sufficient in ensuring its uh, security and defense. And all of these taken together must be multiplied then the future will be ensured. Thank you, Mr. President. Your confidence is really contagious. Thank you and your noble, uh, every success in your noble deeds. Thank you.